the pickup door. I was saying, shut the door. Grow that biomass six feet high. Memorial Day yellow pollen flies. Grow the crimp up front, planting at the same time. One trip farming is a friend of mine. Well, if you like that tune, know that the lyrics will be featured in a soon-to-be-published book of poems authored by today's virtual field day host, Levi Lyle. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Galens with Practical Farmers of Iowa, and accompanying me behind the scenes is Haley Nelson. We're broadcasting live today from Levi Lyle's family <laughs> farm near Kyoto in Washington County. We're back one month after Levi roll crimped a rye cover crop. See how that looks. And we're also going to learn about killing weeds with electricity with the weed zapper. Before we go any further, some credits and thank yous at the top. This event is a joint effort between Practical Farmers of Iowa and our partner, Dr. Kathleen Dellett, Organic Ag Specialist at Iowa State University. This field day is sponsored by the Iowa Organic Association. Since 2006, the Iowa Organic Association has led efforts to provide Iowans the information, support, and resources necessary to succeed in the organic industry. Our membership is a diverse community committed to advancing organic agriculture and foods in Iowa, and by Pipeline Foods. Pipeline Foods is accelerating the availability and reliability of organic, non-GMO, and regeneratively grown food. We bring transparent, sustainable supply chain solutions to connect the dots for our farming partners and end users of organic grains and ingredients. And by the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service, otherwise known as MOSES. Moses offers training, information, and farmer-to-farmer -farmer support to help you grow organically. To get answers about sustainable farming practices and organic rules, call the organic hotline at 888-90-MOSES. That's 888-906-6737. And by the Rodale Institute Midwest Organic Center. The Rodale Institute Midwest Organic Center is a new organic research and education hub for farmers, researchers, ag professionals, and the public. On-farm technical support is available to assist you in transitioning any portion of your farm to organic production. I'd also like to thank our major A-level sponsors for supporting this entire field day season. We couldn't put together all these great virtual field days this summer without the support of these organizations and institutions. We thank you dearly. I'd also like to thank our B-level sponsors who also are helping us put on all of these great virtual field days across the state with some of our members. Again, we can't do it without these institutions, organizations, and individuals. Thank you very, very much. Uh, just a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. PFI is a farmer member organization. As such, we go where our farmers tell us to go. We achieve our mission by helping farmers connect and share knowledge in any which way. We're doing this today through a virtual field day. You can learn more about the many other great things we do with our members on our website listed here. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Here's how this virtual field day is gonna go. We're going to start with a brief message from Dr. Kathleen Dellett, who again is a partner on this project. She's heading a project on no-till organic that Levi is a part of. Then we're going to go to Levi live on the farm to discuss the results of the roller crimping from a month ago, and then talk about weed zapping on his farm. Uh, as far as Q&A is concerned, Levi requested that we conduct Q&A at the end of the session. But as we go, please do enter any questions or comments you have in the comment box in Facebook. I'll be monitoring those throughout and I'll relay those to Levi at the end during the Q&A session. To get acquainted with that comment box, please go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear you and see you. And then uh, 
finally, at the end of the session, I'm going to ask that uh, you tell us how you thought of this uh, virtual field day. Uh, these are new to us. I'm sure they're new to you. And we're going to value your input, as we always do at Practical Farmers. I'll post a link to a survey evaluation in the comment box. I'll do that very shortly, and I'll do that again at the end of the session. And please know that uh, if you fill out that uh, evaluation survey, you will be entered into a drawing to win a PFI branded water bottle. So please let us know what you think, and you might also win something. Okay, so we're going to uh, get on with the field day. And uh, Haley, if you would please play our pre recorded message from Dr. Dellett, who again is a partner on the project. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second organic no-till field day. We're here at the Neely Canyon Farm because we cannot be out in the field with Levi when he demonstrates the weed zapper because of safety reasons. So we're here at the Neely Canyon Farm in Greenfield, Iowa. This is our organic no-till vegetable plots. We uh, rolled this rye and hairy vetch at the end of May and transplanted these squash June 8th. So we'll let you know how they go the rest of the season. We've been doing organic no-till out here since 2011, both in soybeans and in vegetable crops. So I'd like to uh, thank Levi Lyle and his family for offering his, uh, his farm as an on-farm demonstration site and Practical Farmers of Iowa for this field day, and also our sponsor, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, for sponsoring this Conservation Innovation Grant Project. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Levi Lyle. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks, Kathleen. We're out here in the field today, and we're going to take a look first at the soybeans that have been roller crimped and talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing, and then we'll get to the weed zapping portion here in, in just a little bit. So um, let me flip the screen around and show you these soybeans. So this is the 30 inch rows. And as you can see, we have really great weed suppression and there is um, not enough weeds out here to run the weed zapper live today. But I have a lot of really good videos I'm gonna share with you um, and good information. So we're gonna to get to that here in just a few minutes. Um, I wanna to touch upon just a couple points about the roller crimping system because these last few weeks, guys and girls have been out there roller crimping. Here are the 15 inch rows and you can see the emergence of the soybeans has come through. The weeds are very suppressed here. But um, people often ask about equipment and I was on a farm recently where uh, a farmer had the perfect setup. He had a planter that had uh, coulters on it. He had um, row cleaners that he could get up high and out of the way. So they should have been out of the way, but he still had trouble um, cutting through his rye and, and having rye tangle up in the front of his planter. So it was a situation where one wouldn't expect it to be that way. Some of the rye had blown down. It was a really high biomass out there. So he had wrapping on his row cleaners. We ended up pulling off the row cleaners. We ended up pulling off the coulters and we had to pull off the, uh, the, the mount to the coulters because they were grabbing the rye. So for me, it was a good example that even in a situation where you think you know exactly how it should be, there's always going to be variables thrown at you. So um, that was a situation where we were able to make that adjustment and, and then it worked perfect. He was able to plant his crop and I couldn't have really advised him through that over the phone. I was fortunate to be there because we were able to look at the situation and address it. But that's the way uh, this system is and a farmer has to be aware of those kinds of variables and adapt on the go. Um, the second most question I get is about population and what a guy or girl should plant at. And to that, um, I recommend going with what the, the research says, you know, 200,000 plus seeds per acre. But a farmer, farmers certainly do have success at more traditional rates, say 130,000 seeds on 30 inch rows. I've seen that work. So a farmer needs to start small and then move into that. Um, so with that, um, let's go ahead and move. Oh, wait, wait. I want to say um, a couple resources that have been paramount in, in my coming to understand this roller crimping system um, is 
things that Dr. Erin Silva out of University of Madison, Wisconsin puts out there. She's done more on the research of roller crimping than, than anybody else probably. Um, also, the, um, the inventor of the roller crimper and CEO of the Rodale Institute is Jeff Moyer. He wrote the first book that I'm aware of on uh, um, organic no-till agriculture. And he is just coming out with a new addition to his book that will have all the latest research on roller crimping and organic agriculture. And that book should be out here in late summer. So those are resources I saw early on and I recommend other people seek to, to learn more about this system as they get into it. All right, so um, go ahead and cue video. We'll go to the weed zapping and we'll- Hey, Levi. Yes? Hey, can we show the video of the crimping from a month ago? Oh, I'm sorry. You want to yeah. go ahead and show Let's, that? Yeah, go ahead and start out with that video, and we'll go right into the other video then. So here we came out with two types of roller crimping systems. We had the Dawn, which you do not see in the video, and the Rodale model roller, which is in this video, and then the planting of those soybeans, and we looked at that, and this is footage from the last field day. So thanks for bringing that up, Steph. And that's, um, that's how these beans started out, and now we're at the point here where we're four weeks in exactly, and we're able to look at the soybeans that have emerged, and we see that there's a good um, expression of wheat. So here we have the first time I viewed the weed zapper. So a neighbor is in this tractor and he brought the weed zapper out and went over a couple of acres on our place and um, video should take off here. It's um, the, mounted on the back of this tractor. You see the copper bar that, uh, that represents the, the killing element of this unit is on the back and uh, you'll see when we get up close to my tractor that actually we have the bar on the front of the tractor, which is a more effective way to do it. So here you're also going to see that um, I am too close to the camera. <laughs> I mean, too close to the action here. 50 feet is the rule on how close you wanna to be to this equipment. Um, this is high voltage electricity. You know, the gentleman you're seeing come into the picture needs to get back. He, that's not where you want to be. That is a dangerous location to be because this is high voltage electricity. Um, that is one of the most important aspects to this piece of equipment. And that said, I'm going to talk a lot about safety today. Um, old school manufacturing, uh, maker of the weed zapper, has a lot of good information out there about running their equipment. Today, I'm going to touch upon the safety points because that's the most important thing to the people at Old School Manufacturing, they have made a, many improvements to this machine to make it, um, it safe, safe for users. So this is footage of last year when I was running the weed zapper. Um, I was running it at sundown and there was a lot of a mare's tail in that particular field and it did an excellent job on it. Um, those are actually GMO beans that I'm in there. And um, this field that you're seeing now is this week, actually, I was running it in a flax field. Off to the right, you see the computer screen. I'm gonna talk about it quickly. It has generator temperature, 130, amps, 300. Both of those categories are important because you have a range that goes up to um, 200 on the um, generator temperature. I'll get into that here a little bit more. It's moving through the video quicker than I realized, but this is yesterday. I went out to that flax field and the giant ragweed in that field was completely dead and it did an excellent job of killing those weeds. It will kill virtually any weeds. Uh, I haven't had any trouble with it killing a weed. The key aspects to killing these weeds is uh, touch time. So if you go slow enough and your weed pressure is less, it does um, a good job of killing the weeds. There are fields where I have made a second pass in order to get a good kill on the, the weeds that come back. Um, I'm flying through the topics here that I had in my mind. Um, let me, because I don't want to forget it, and um, and we're not actually going to fire up the computer system today, but there was a video that showed the monitor on the, um, the weed zapper unit, 
and it was a box that had the generator temperature, which is very important. Let me talk about that. The generator temperature said that the temperature was 130 degrees, and at 200 degrees, your generator um, kicks out and goes through a cooling process. So that is a safety aspect that protects the equipment. Um, then there's also um, the amps, which go up to 400 amps, and that fluctuates depending on how, how heavy the weeds are in that you're in. Um, the amps will heat up your generator quicker if you're running amps that are above about 120. So you can kind of watch those amps as you're going through the field and then adjust your speed accordingly to keep your amps lower, therefore keeping your generator temperature lower. And then the third item down on that computer, if you go back later and look at the video, was your um, your uh, your your generator RPMs. If the generator RPMs run less than 400, it, or I mean 1500, it kicks off the system because the generator is not built to run. Thank you, Haley, for bringing this up. The generator is not meant to run less than 1500, so that protects the equipment from uh, from damage by monitoring that generator RPM. Then there's mile per hour. There are colders on the front, and we'll do a walk around the machine, but the colders have speed sensors that require you go at least at 1.5, 1.5 miles per hour in order for the system to run, and that you go under a certain miles per hour. I think it's four or something. So um, there is a um, those safety features to this equipment. Uh, I'm gonna move toward, uh, well, there's also volts on there, which goes up to uh, 400 volts. Um, that's the middle box there on that monitor. So those are the operations within the computer that they have created, which really help to run this equipment safely. Now, uh, as I come in here to where the generator is, first thing I want to point out is this seat cushion. So this seat cushion goes up in the cab, of course, and you sit on it and it plugs into the computer. And if you get off the seat, the system shuts off. So you have to be seated at all times while running this equipment. Of course, there is not to be a passenger in the tractor with you, and there shouldn't be any, there sh there's not to be anybody in the, anywhere within 50 feet of running this machine. Uh, I will take this time to talk a little bit about the power that this machine puts out. So when you drive down the road and you look up and you see transformers on the road, that's what we're looking at here. This is a transformer identical to the ones on the, the power lines along the road. It is high voltage. So it's 20,000 kV. We're generating um, power to run a farm back here on this PTO generator. And we're channeling it through a series of uh, wires that go up to the front of the, or you know, a big cable, a 20 kV cable that goes to the front of the tractor. And I'll show you that in a few moments. And it delivers the um, 400 volts up to the front. So um, uh, I am not great at like electricity and talking about that kind of thing, but an analogy that really helped me in terms of talking about power is that you have it flows like water. So in thinking of electricity like water, the volts is the, the water coming out. So 400 volts and the amps is the diameter of that hose. So here we have high volt, high amps, and uh, we're using it to boil the weeds. Um, we'll get into a little bit of that. This is the electronics of the machine. And that's about all there is back here. You, if I kind of get down here close and intimate with it, you can see there's a belt. It needs to be tightened up uh, um, every 40 acres. You just kind of crank on this. And, um, tighten the belt if needed, and then you've got the PTO in there that runs it. Now, I will do a quick walk around the machine. So here are the colders that have a speed sensor on it. So this colder must be in contact with the ground. And here we have a copper bar, which is simply a grounding bar. In the footage of the roller crimper at night, one sees, and you you would have noticed it on on the video that um, the the grass is a great example. It continues to spark after this front bar has touched it. So as it's a couple feet behind it, it's just like fizzling, and so there's still uh, I'd say static charge in it. 
and this bar eliminates it, any charge that remains before the tractor comes through. And here we have the copper, the main copper bar. This is the power source, and this wire is the one that runs to it and goes back to the generator. I'm going to mention the hydraulics on this tractor. So having it front mounted allows for three angles of contact. So the front lift allows you to go up and down and that's necessary to, um, to adjust as you go through the field, but it also allows you to tip like this, which you're constantly doing as you come in and out of larger weeds and um, areas like our, that are draws. So you want to use that tilt. And then your wings that fold up and down is the third um, angle the hydraulics are used for. And it's helpful as you come into contour areas to make slight adjustments with the wings. And that's a little bit about um, utilizing this equipment. I think I have touched upon um, a number of points. I'll just keep rolling here because there's other things on my mind. Um, this machine works on anything. When I first bought it, I was <laughs> skeptical as the next person. I'll tell a little story. Um, I was doing organic inspections and a farmer with a pretty weedy field told me that he was going to use a, a, a weed zapper in order to uh, clean up his, his field. And I thought it was, uh, I was, I was skeptical. But soon after, I learned of old school manufacturing and their implement, and I thought local farmers need to have one of these. So I go around and use it on organic acres that are in our area and help farmers out by um, doing a custom rate to, to clean up their field. The weeds it works best on are succulent. So in August, when everything is pretty succulent is when it works good. I've seen it work well on foxtail also which is a grass, but um, mainly giant ragweed, mare's tail, thistle. Um, those, are, those are the weeds that we've been using it on in the fields I'm in. Um, so at that, let me, um, let me bring Stefan in and um, see if there's other things you can bring to light that I could cover. Sure, great stuff, Levi. We've got a few questions in the chat box. There's a few pertaining to the crimping rye and also a few pertaining to the weed zapper. How about we start with the roll crimping rye? Mm -hmm. So Very good. first question was, what was your seeding rate for the winter rye? What, about pounds per acre. The seeding rate for the rye was two bushels per acre. Um, two and a half bushels is, um, Often what I go with also, so because this is an organic system, I really like to push up the seeding rate. Um, that way I, I know I'm gonna have weed suppression out there. <clears throat> okay, and then um, here's a question, and I can't remember this from the, from the last time, Levi, but what was the um, biomass at the time of crimping? I know you and Kathleen had uh, determined it, but do you remember how thick, what the pounds per mm -hmm. acre of, of above ground biomass was? Yeah, we calculated that it was above 5,000 pounds per acre, and that's really where you want to be at with your biomass. Um, it's not to say you have to have um, uh, two bushels an acre out there to get that. If if you seed your if you seed one bushel an acre early enough and you have fertility, um, the, the rye can tiller. Um, I was just told here in the background seven. To 10,000 is what we had out here. So, um, but you can get biomass with a, a lesser amount of rye if the conditions are right. Okay, great. Well, th those were the questions pertaining to the rye and the uh, crimper. Um, Stefan, and there's a question Stefan, about the volts. Stefan, yeah, go ahead. I know, I know you're going to keep the questions coming, but let me mention a couple points that, that as, as I think of them actually. Um, there are some safety aspects to the machine that I, I want to just make sure and talk about a little bit more because they are so important. But you see 
you can't see from the camera probably, but on top of the unit, there is a flashing light. So when the PTO is engaged on this unit, the, there is a, a light that flashes constantly. So anybody in the vicinity would know, okay, stay away from this machine. So um, that is something that it goes um, away, away towards communicating with others while you're running this machine. Um, and um, as long as the, um, the, the on button to the mechanism that creates charge up front is off, the, um, the tractor would be safe. But it is that element of electricity where you should never get out of a tractor with a PTO generator running because there's the potential for the charge to have a short or something like that. So um, we always make sure the PTO is off when we get out of the tractor. That was a side note, but uh, um, I may bring up more safety points <laughs> as we talk because that's a big part of running a piece of equipment like this. Great, so actually there was a request to um, watch the video again. So I'm gonna have mm -hmm. Haley just play that and that'll Good. roll and um and how about i'll just i can feed you some more questions and while that's rolling how's that sound levi very good i'll keep talking good okay so then there's a question you mentioned um that you uh use the zapper on other acres other farms um can you mind sharing your custom rate to uh, run the zapper on other farms what do you charge what i learned yeah, what I learned is I can't just say an amount, uh, and I'll tell you some of the very reasons. Um, at $75 an acre, um, I could go in and, and um, do a field that has been cultivated already. If, field, if a field of soybeans has been cultivated, you've effectively reduced the potential for half of your weeds because of the cultivation, and then you're only dealing with, say, giant ragweed, for example, that's right in your soybean row. Um, that allows me to move through the field uh, above three mile an hour, usually, and keep moving without the generator needing to go down a cool down. Now, if I'm in a field of, say, spring peas, say, like last week, um, there are no rows out there. So any weeds that are out there are um, going to be, um, you know, possibly thick. So um, I would need to stop. Um, each round and let the generator go through uh, a two minute cool down phase before I continue. And so I have to keep the, um, the PTO um, running at 1500 RPMs during the cool down and uh, that uses fuel and time. So um, that has led to me sometimes charging up to $150 an acre and it depends on the situation. And um, that has worked well. Farmers that I've worked with um, have been um, tickled to death that the, their weeds can be addressed and that they can go out there the day after I have weed zapped and see a new field. It's really an incredible moment when one realizes the potential that electricity brings. And um, that's why I'm excited to use this machine and tell others about it. Great, uh, there's a, another zapper question. Uh, is it effective at killing velvet leaf or buttonweed? What do you think? Ooh, good question. Yeah, um, it actually, um, thank you for bringing that up. Actually, buttonweeds are the exception. It does not do a very good job in the buttonweeds I was in. So time of year, you know, time of the summer could come into play, but um, the buttonweed is a very fuzzy plant and it, um, did not kill the buttonweed well great uh, and i was in the field with lots of buttonweeds uh, um that led to an, an inquiry inquiry as to what it is about that fuzzy nature of, of is that the reason that it doesn't do a great job on buttonweeds um so then i started looking at the soybeans that we had accidentally tagged as we were um, driving in the field and what one farmer observed was we were in his field before bloom of the soybeans and where we got down and accidentally we zapped some of the soybeans he had additional branching and possibly improved yield on his soybeans that said it doesn't appear that um, electricity hurts soybeans very bad either if you're ahead of bloom at least uh, because 
soybeans are pretty fuzzy. So um, I've been on the lookout to identify some fuzzy soybeans um, and observing the different varieties I'm seeing out there to see which ones are um, best adapted with use of electricity. But that's, that's a good question. Button weeds are um, a little bit different than other weeds that we have out here in our fields. Okay, a quick clarification on your custom rate. So would you say your range is about 75 to $150 per hour to charge to, no. to run the machine? No, that's, that's per acre. Or per acre, excuse me, per acre. Sorry, mm -hmm. 75 to $150 per acre. That was my mm -hmm. mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this, is a, this is a good question. Uh, is there any concern um, with plant moisture if it's too dry, will it light the field on fire? There is an arc that can come off of the uh, the, the copper bar in front. So um, yeah, th there has been fire. I, I debated on whether to include my video of the little fire I started a week ago in a waterway. Um, you know, it's nice to have waterways cleaned up and mowed, but in crossing a waterway that had been mowed, um, it was probably an arc that jumped off of my coulter, actually, it, um, an arc that started that grass on fire. That is troublesome because you can't do what a farmer would normally do and just jump out of the tractor and go stomp on the fire. You've got electricity flowing, you've got a generator, you need to shut down. Um, it's just kind of my personal preference to also set my front coulters down after I shut the generator off just to make sure all charge is diffused. And then I get out and then I go start stomping on a fi little fire that has been caused in the waterway. So there is a fire extinguisher on board um, of the equipment. So that is another safety aspect. Um, it definitely, there's definitely that risk that a fire could be caused if you're in dry matter. So um, if I were to run it out here today where there's not many weeds, I would have had to run the bar very close to the ground to even address the few weeds that are there now. So that could have potentially caused the fire. Good question. Okay, we'll take one more question and it does refer to the height of the, uh, the zapper and the weeds. Uh, would it be necessary for weeds to be taller or can you change the height of the zapper? You can change the height of the zapper. So these pins that are right here can be uh, raised. So when it gets to um, August, we raise it up here. The soybeans are taller, we're running it up here, and that way the whole uh, um, machine is level up front. So that adjustment is very helpful as we get into later season. Great, thanks Levi. Well, any parting uh, words or comments before we sign off this afternoon? I have a couple words I'd like to mention as people think about what questions they might have. First of all, first of all, uh, I would like to mention that the um, the people at Old School Manufacturing, it's a small family business, they have a lot of really great resources at their website, the weedzapper.com. They are very thorough in their tutorials and that's why today I've mainly focused on aspects of safety. But they have this incentive program for a customer like myself, where if I refer somebody, uh, I could get $500 from them. I've asked it whether or not they would um, donate $500 to Practical Farmers of Iowa for anybody who um, comes to them and is a new customer, and they have said they would. So um, if approaching old school manufacturing to buy a piece of equipment, let them know that you learned about it from Practical Farmers of Iowa or Levi Lyle, and we'll have um, any of those funds go as a donation to Practical Farmers of Iowa. I think that's a really good way to give back to Practical Farmers of Iowa, and I, in part, am very thankful that Practical Farmers of Iowa gives a voice to farmers in this manner, and so that's, um, I think, a worthy cause. Um, Go ahead, if there's any other questions, give people a chance. Okay, well, not, first of all, uh, we're, Levi, we're getting a lot of love for that offer um, that uh, you're making or that deal you're making with, um, with uh, Old School Manufacturing. We very much appreciate your generosity. That means a lot to us. Um, there is one more question about, um, do you sometimes have to make a second pass with the weed zapper? 
Yeah, sometimes I've made a second pass with uh, with the weed zapper. I'm trying to think if if I just would have gone slower, you know, it, it might have been the case that I wouldn't have to make a second pass. But there's a judgment that has to be made out there. Okay, so what's the right speed? You can't go under 1.5 miles per hour or the system will kick off for safety reasons. So as you approach that speed, um, you know, you just, you just keep moving. And um, then the ragweed at times has come not completely died so I come back in and hit a second time that's more rare though in cultivated soybeans I haven't had that issue at all in a field where it was just um, like you would almost think they were growing ragweed instead of the crop right like that's a situation where you're doing a crop saving measure and um, I've made a second pass well great thanks a lot Levi uh, that gets us to uh, at our time and um, we're going to let you go and we'll let all our viewers go and have a great rest of this uh, hot July afternoon ahead of our uh, 4th of July weekend. Great. So Stefan, thanks again, please. Levi. For... Oh, go ahead. Um, I was just going to mention, I have a poem about the lightning thief. Um, it is a weed zapper poem. I'll read it briefly and maybe that could be our exit from the program. Great. So we're going to have one last word from Levi. And uh, we'll sign off after that. Thanks a lot for joining, everybody. Go ahead, Levi. All right, thank you. This poem is called The Lightning Thief, and it is also in my upcoming book. The more I, the more I farm, the more I find. I've got weeds of every kind. Hit them with Roundup, chemical blast. Kill them dead, but it did not last. Hit them a second time at a double rate. Now food smells like glyphosate on my plate. I'm sick of this poison, the bitter taste. You can't beat nature at her own race. Now I have a new set of tools. I'm the lightning thief. Electric zap those weeds and cause them grief. Gonna boil their guts from root to leaf. Who knows? Maybe we will save the coral reef. Thank you.